You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examinations. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Hey, everybody. We're back. Your host, Michael, on Reason and Theology, joined by Kevin Simmons. We are talking about examining the prod propaganda of AA1025, a book that was published a while back. But before we dive in, welcome back to the show, Kevin. How are you? I'm okay. It's been a busy morning. Uh, how about you? A little busy, uh, but good, good so far. I'm excited about this one. I've uh, heard quite a few people bringing it up lately, so I understand you have a PowerPoint presentation for us. Why don't you maybe start us out with introductory material? What exactly is AA1025, and why are we addressing this? Actually, that's all on the PowerPoint. <laughs> all right. Well, let's do it. If you want to share right. your screen, I'll uh, I'll enable it on my end. Okay. There we go. All right. I got it pulled up. In, in order to use my handy-dandy clicker, I had to undo my... Uh, separate mouse so i'm going to be leaning over if i have to like this to get to grab for the uh for the touchpad on my laptop here so that'll work Ooh. okay before i begin this is this going to work uh sure looks I, like I gotta, it's yeah i gotta make sure it's gonna mm -hmm. ah okay yeah good all right yep it's showing up <laughs> that'll all work the wonders of technology huh oh yeah <laughs> okay and is the sound still okay? Yeah, sounds good to me. Okay. The Death Star is still above me, as people like right. to call it. I just got it out of frame now. So. Just out of the <laughs> shot. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, we're going to be talking about the book AA1025 and the mm -hmm. author, Marie Carré. Uh, this came up recently when we did the video with Dom about the uh, book Pied Deux Devant l'Histoire. Some people had commented underneath saying, hey, now do something on that book too. So I thought, okay, well, I, I was open to it. And then we were chatting about it and it seemed like it was a good idea. So I was able to put a PowerPoint together with things. Um, this book is very popular among traditionalist circles and it's used to promote the idea of infiltration of the church. And that's what we're going to be looking at is more about the book itself, the author, and some of the unique historical things that took place. Uh, the picture that you see here is actually of one of the French editions, ES 1025, or the Memoirs of an Anti-Apostle, published by Diffusion de la Pensée Française, uh, Diffusion of French Thought, is another word to translate that. But this cover is not one that most everybody would be familiar with, the one that most everybody would be familiar with would be this one. This is the Tan Books edition, a uh, cover of the book, and uh, famous orange and, and white cover. Uh, it's been in public print since, I think, 1991. But this is the one that most everybody would be familiar with. I've seen one that looks a lot like Taylor Marshall's infiltration cover. Which one is that? That's a more recent reprinting of the book. Okay. I don't have a copy of that. It's the same book, but it's a more recent uh, printing of the book. Gotcha. I don't know if that was done by Tan or another publisher, but it was uh, redone to be a little bit more fancy than the one that a lot of older Catholics especially would be familiar with. Okay. And I don't have a photo of it in the PowerPoint because I actually don't have the book. And so I wasn't able to take my own photo of it. So I don't want to get in trouble with copyright stuff. <laughs> so I was like, nope, sorry. But yeah, there is a striking resemblance between the two, uh, Taylor Marshall's book, the cover for it, uh, and the Memoirs of an Anti-Apostle book in, the, one of the, in that reprint there. So the back of the book describes itself as follows. In the 1960s, a French Catholic nurse, Marie Carré, attended an auto crash victim who was brought into her hospital in a city she purposely does not name. 
The man lingered there near death for a few hours and then died. He had no identification on him, but he had a briefcase. Where have you heard the briefcase story before? Uh, in which there was a set of quasi-biographical notes. She kept these notes and read them, and because of their extraordinary content, decided to publish them. The result is, is this little book, AA 1025, The Memoirs of an Anti-Apostle, about a communist who purposely entered the Catholic priesthood, along with many, many others, with the intent to subvert and destroy the church from within. This little book, his strange yet fascinating and illuminating set of biographical notes, tells of his commission to enter the priesthood, his various experiences in the seminary, and the means and methods he used and promoted to help effect from within the auto-dissolution of the Catholic Church. Absorbing and compelling reading from beginning to end, AA 1025, The Memoirs of an Anti-Apostle, is must-reading for every Catholic today and for all who would understand just what has happened to undermine the Catholic Church since the 1960s. No one will read this book without a profound assent that something just like that, just like what is described here, must surely have happened on a wide scale in order to have disrupted the life of the Catholic Church so dramatically. <clears throat> so that's the back of the book, Tan Editions description. When we look at it, we, we have to look at the tone as well as the content, or content as well as tone. I think I and I decided to put the text back up here to remind people of what 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 was there as, as I go through this. But it, it purports to be based upon documents from an infiltrator of the church, and that these documents were discovered after the infiltrator's death by the nurse who cared for him. Uh, the book the 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 description is very very sensational, uh, it, you know, very very kind of powerful, and it leads to one to kind of believe, well, this actually could very well be true. There's no disclaimer on the back of the book. So any average person that just picks this up and read it might be tempted to think, wait, is this a true story? So we ask ourselves then, what is the literary genre of the book? Is it fiction, historical fiction, a biography? Is it the actual truth? Was there a nurse who found this guy with this briefcase and these documents? That's what you have to ask. And we are given this information in the interior of the book. There is a, in the French edition, there's a notice, and, uh, and the, it's rendered into English uh, in the Tan Books edition as follows. This book is a dramatized presentation of certain facts which are occurring in the church and which are perplexing to many of the faithful. All resemblance to persons or contemporary events are not to be considered as purely accidental. So note what this says. It's a dramatized presentation. Right there, we know that this is kind of, a, we, we, it's, it's not a true story. It just doesn't state it directly. It says it's a dramatized presentation of certain facts. Well, what are these certain facts? The guy with the briefcase, the nurse, what? You know, uh, what What are these certain facts? But then it then says, all resemblance to persons or contemporary events are not to be considered as purely accidental. Most people who read this may, it may summon the ghost of what you see at the end of the movie credits, if anybody makes that five movie credits, uh, when it says, you know, all, all resemblances to living persons or events, actual or intended, uh, are purely coincidental. But this text doesn't say that. It says all resemblance to persons or contemporary events are not to be considered as purely accidental. So in other words, there is some semblance here uh, to reality. Remember, it's a dramatized presentation. So they're going after some facts or some events, but the story, the vehicle, if you will, driving the narrative, uh, that's, you know, that's what's going to be questioned here. Or some, some might want to reverse that and say it's the narrative that's going to, no, not necessarily. But the general idea is the book is going to be a dramatized account through a story 
in this case, the not uh, the nurse, the briefcase, the guy, you know, all these documents and telling his life story. So that's what's dramatized, but it's meant to bring the reader to certain truths, which are among them being the infiltration of the church, communist agitators within the church trying to undermine this, that, or the other thing. That's the general principle uh, being driven at here. So based upon the book's own descriptions, we might be able to argue AA 1025 is historical fiction. And I say might because the book's uh, premise of certain facts is not quite established. So we're going to be loosely calling this, uh, or, or we're going to call this loosely based historical fiction. So that was based on some basic questions. When was AA 1025 published? It was published for, uh, first in France in May of 1972 by Edition Cegib, uh in Frenouz as ES 1025, the picture that we saw earlier. But that was a different, that was the, 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 the Pensee version, the Diffusion publication, not the original. I don't have the book, uh, the first edition from 1972. Um, so I don't have a photo of that. But I do have, and I actually have it right here in front of me, I do have a copy of the English edition that was published that you see here. I took a photo of it and everything. Um, edition Saint Raphael uh, on Rue King Quest, Suite 212 in Sherbrooke, Quebec, Canada. And that's, I took a picture of the cover here, so you can see that. But then we also had the other English edition by Tan Books in 1991. That's the picture that we saw earlier. So the Tan Books edition was following the color scheme of the um, uh, uh, the St. Raphael editions. There's no need to go through the entire story that's presented in the book. That's not our goal here. And I leave it for people to read. It, it, it's a fairly gripping story, unless you're a historian, then in which case you're just cringing all the way through. But for your average audience, which is what the book is intended for, it goes by pretty quick. Um, but we're not going to get into the general uh, the, the the whole story. The general idea of it is this guy is found uh, he, as as a toddler. He's raised and indoctrinated into communist ideas. Uh, he's told to become a Catholic priest. Uh, he does so. He starts getting involved with a relationship with a woman, and there's a, a, a high born I think French lady there, uh, and all these things happen. It's it's a very interesting story, but that's the the story itself. Again, the primary plot concerns communist infiltration of the church. Again, it is a make-believe story that dramatizes events the author believes to be happening within the Catholic Church. Now, the astute reader will, or a viewer will note how I, how I phrase this. Make-believe story that dramatizes events. We've already seen that earlier. But also, the author believes to be happening within the Catholic Church. I put that as a little bit more subjective because at this point we don't have evidence. There's no proving of the author's core assertions that the church was infiltrated. That's generally uh, an accepted premise nowadays, the how and the who and the precise mechanisms that's all up for debate right now. Um, but uh, some of it we can say at base is true, but some not. But I still wanted to speak in terms of subjectivity because not everything is proven, uh, and won't we won't prove everything in the purpose of uh, in this uh, interview here because we're not going to. That's not the purpose of it. No, I love that picture. I got it from Pixabay. It's just a great picture of you know. It's kind of kind of gets that idea of you know bad clergy, you know. So we can argue, when you read the book and what we know thus far, we can argue that the book is Marie Carré's way of explaining through literary artifice the troubles experienced by the Catholic Church uh, by the time of the book's publication in 1972. <clears throat> so the next basic question is, who was Marie Carré? Uh, you'll see here at the picture, this is from uh, the Diffusion de la Pensée Française website, 
where they have a photo of her and a description in French. I put the link here for interested persons to follow up on it. Uh, this is a rough translation. I'm sure Dom could re <laughs> refine this a bit, but um, the the website that publishes her just describes her as she was she was raised in Calvinism and she wondered early on or early wondered if her religion was true and especially why there were so many true Christianities that opposed one another, sometimes tolerated one another, uh, fight from time to time. All these questions or whys set Marie Carré towards the primitive church, then towards the Reformation, a journey which ended with her return to the ancient first and universal unity. Because we must not forget that unity to be truly one, it has to date from Pentecost. Beyond that, one can only cultivate ambiguities. Marie Carré died in France in 1984. She had quite a big literary success with her little book, AA 1025, translated into several languages. It was even plagiarized and stolen. Uh, the book, the authors don't just don't say who plagiarized or who stole. So I have no information on that. Suspicions, yes, but no information. And I'm not going to talk about my personal uh, opinions on that matter. But this is, when you look at the French, this is a rough translation in, into the English. There's also a book on her, uh, a biography, that was written by um, Hermine Nouvelle de la Flèche. And it's about 24 pages. It's, it came out in 2000. Um, an 18 itself was based upon some information in the um, in, a, in another publication called Lecteur et Tradition, uh, also in French, that came out in September of 2014, uh, number 41, I think it was. So, anybody's interested, here are the sources if you want to know more about her. But they're all of it, they're all they're all only in, in French, so you have to be French speaking in order to understand these things and there's a train going by so if you hear a loud noise all of a sudden <laughs> that's uh that's what it, my house is located right along some train tracks so a unique thing then is and we kind of see this developing that in the anglophone world the english-speaking world most people only know marie carré through the book aa 1025 but just with the, what little we've seen so far, it's clear that she has more cred, as it were, more of a presence in the French-speaking world, the Francophone world. And she does, in fact, have a larger literary output in that world. Some examples here, not, not exhaustive, are uh, the, 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 the titles that you see here, the one that the... Uh, second one up from the bottom, or third one from the bottom, ES 1025, that's the one that we're talking about. But she had a lot of other books before that. I happen to own some of them. So, for instance, um, one of them is her book, the, the Shepherd of Shepherds. I have that one here. Another one is The Mass, an open letter to Jesus of Nazareth in Galilee. And even her book, Life of Jesus. So I have those ones. And also, I also have some of the individual writings from hers or interviews that appeared in Lecture et Tradition. I've had these books now for several years, I think, about seven years, or give or take. And she even wrote a biography. I think the biography is between uh, J'ai choisi l'unité and uh, the memoirs of a, of a young, happy girl, the ones that you see there towards the top in 64 and 65. So she even has a bio she even has biographical information, autobiog autobiography right there on herself. But again, it never carried over into English. That's going to create a problem. Um, she was well known among French traditionalists. She appeared in Lecteur de Tradition, and this is an actual interview by Alexandre Barivaux um, with her. You can see that picture on the right there, and that's a cover of, the, of that particular edition. And I have that one here. And her book, Life of Jesus, also has a preface by none other than Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre himself, the man, the myth, the legend. So there it is right there, dated March 15th of 1969. 
so she she's she's well known. I mean, this this is not this lady is not no no slouch in the in the French trad world. The book AA 1025 came to the attention of Thomas A. Nelson, who was, I believe, the founder of Tan Books. But it was only after his edition that the book spread like wildfire in the English speaking world. I was trying to find a fitting image to do wildfire, and I thought that was going to be the best one. And some confusion arose after the Tan Books edition. Uh, you, we read the description earlier, and the disclaimer that you find at the beginning that we talked about, yes, it's there, but there's not a lot of focus on it. And so confusion arose. Is, is this book fact? Is it historical fiction? Is it a true I mean, is it a true story? What's the story? What's going on here? You know, and I personally suspect that the reason why this confusion or a major contributing factor to this uh, confusion was because the Tan Books edition didn't really offer much by way of introducing us to Marie Carré and telling us more about her work in the traditionalist uh, world in France. So we were divorced from that world, if you will. We were divorced from her biography. It was just her book gets plopped into the English-speaking world, no context, no frame of reference, uh, as far as I understand it, from best as I can tell from the, from the searches that I've done. Uh, and being divorced from that means that we're going to lose something almost literally in translation. Uh, we need that context to understand what this is all about. But unfortunately, we didn't get that. Fast forward a few years, there was a famous quarrel between the Catholic writer Sandra Measel and Dr. Alice von Hildebrand, who only just recently passed away about seven months ago, uh, earlier this year. And the, the quarrel was over AA 1025. In 2002, Measel had written an article for Crisis Magazine entitled Swinging at Windmills, A Close Look at Catholic Conspiracy Theories. And in this article, Measel took a shot both at the famous ex-communist lawyer Bella Dodd as well as AA1025. And here is what Measel said at the time. Quote, further evidence of faith in communist trickiness is the persistent popularity of Anti-Apostle 1025 by Marie Carré, originally published in France in 1972. This purpose to be a memoir by the 1025th Red to penetrate Catholic seminaries but it is manifestly a feeble example of radical traditionalist propaganda that even fails to factor in the Russian purges. The main character is a Polish orphan, the careful reader will note he's a Jew, recruited by a Soviet spy master between the world wars to penetrate and subvert the Catholic Church. This is supposed to explain post-Vatican II changes, although communist control never altered dogma or worship behind the Iron Curtain. The fable may have been inspired by a remark attributed to a Catholic convert from communism, Bella Dodd, in the 1950s. Dodd implausibly claimed to have sent a thousand young men into American seminaries, but she also insisted that the Communist Party of the United States of America secretly took its orders from American capitalists, end quote. Now, that's all. She, Miesel packed an awful lot into that into that uh, into in this short little text, that one line there where she said the careful reader will note he's a Jew. That was tongue in cheek, I, I believe. I, I believe that was very tongue in cheek because I think what she was driving at there was within radical traditionalist traditionalism and some of its literature. There's a very strong anti-Semitic current. There was a famous dust-up, uh, or somewhat famous dust-up over this matter between um, Father Angelo Marie Geiger of the Franciscan Friars of the Immaculate with, I'm drawing a blank, uh, who it was, who, who he was discussing it with. Um, but this point came up, and he was brutal, brutally attacked over it. Brutally attacked over it. Um, and 
I don't even know if those writings are still available online. We're talking seven, eight, between seven to 10 years ago, I think that that all took place. Um, but it is true. There is a very strong undercurrent. There's, you'll find a, a wide variety of, of anti-Semitism up to and including Holocaust denying. There were no Jews gassed at Auschwitz kind of stuff. Um, I myself have personally experienced that among radical traditionalists, so I'm very well aware of this trend. Um, and so I think she was kind of driving at that uh, when she said that she was kind of like head nodding it there. Uh, I don't claim to have, you know, personal knowledge of it. I'm just simply saying that I think that's what she was driving at here. Uh, very, very tongue in cheek, I suspect. But that's the general point. So Measle is taking questions. Uh, exam, um, that's the word I'm looking for. She's looking for, uh, she, she's getting at the historical problems overall, but also taking a swipe at some of these characterizations because they are riddled with other problems. Well, that's not going to go unnoticed, uh, all of these things, because Dr. Alice von Hildebrand, herself a friend of Bella Dodd, responded to Sandra Measel in her own article, or really I should say letter to the editor, uh, called The Final Swing. And in here you can see the text, but we'll read it. Uh, uh, Alice von Hildebrand says, quote, uh, Sandra Measel does a fine job debunking the fantastic and often absurd conspiratorial inventions that have proliferated in some circles. And she gives the citation. Many of them have been refuted and proven to be totally baseless, but I have a quarrel with some of the arguments that she offered. In a few paragraphs in her article, Measel overshoots her mark and weakens her conclusions. She challenges the authenticity of a book published by a French woman, Marie Carré. She was a nurse who received a call to take care of a man mortally, uh, mortally wounded in a car accident. The dying man had no identification and no passport. All she found was a manuscript that she decided to publish in 1972 under the title AA 1025, the Memoirs of an Anti-Apostle. It relates the story of a young man who, upon discovering that his adoptive parents had lied to him, decided to escape to Russia. Animated by a deadly hatred of the Catholics who had raised him, he decided to dedicate his life to the victory of atheism. Trained by the communists, he was ordered to go back to Poland and play the repentant sinner, enter a seminary as an anti-apostle, and then spend his life working toward the destruction of the Roman Catholic Church. Miesel writes, This is supposed to explain the post-Vatican II changes, although communist control never altered dogma of worship beyond the Iron Curtain. End quote there. This is a non sequitur. AA 1025 was working in the West, not in Eastern Europe. Moreover, the communist regime did not need to change dogmas. Atheism was supreme. A careful reading of the book shows that AA 1025 was much too clever to launch a direct attack on dogmas. His plans were much more subtle, much more professional. To spread doubt, to weaken faith, to undermine tradition, and to ridicule old-fashioned practices that alienate modern man for failing to address themselves to his needs. The next paragraph is still more astonishing. Miesel refers to the book as a fable. There I part ways with the author. As much as I agree with her that the validity of AA 1025 has not been proven, this fact does not disprove the book's truth. Note that distinction there, the book's truth versus the validity. Miesel makes the mistake that hundreds of my students have made. If God's existence is not satisfactorily proven to their taste, they draw the conclusion that it has been disproved. Even if all proofs of his existence were weak and unconvincing, this fact would thereby in no way be disproved. I grant Measle that one can raise many questions concerning the authenticity of this document. I have raised them myself. But once again, this does not prove without a shadow of a doubt that it is not valid. AA 1025 may be a literary invention of Marie Carré, but one must admit that she hits the bullseye from the first page to the last. Some people have extraordinary talents to foresee the future. Carey certainly had an extraordinary perception of how best to harm the church. How surprising indeed that all her inventions have become reality in the post-conciliar church. And the ABH quote. There's a lot there. We could spend quite a, quite a bit unpacking it. But to keep it simple... Uh, Alice von Hildebrand basically defended the book and she made some distinctions. Uh, 
but the overall gist of things that happened with this was her Alison Hildebrand's credibility made the book even more popular. Uh, I, 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 if, if Dr. Von Hildebrand was still alive, I probably would want to talk to her about some of her statements in, in this. Um, but nevertheless, you know, she's, as I said, she's no longer with us. Sandra Measel responded to Dr. Von Hildebrand in the text that you see here. Uh, and I think it's important that I know that they're like long quotes and stuff, but I think it's important for us to look at this because these texts are actually very difficult to find. Uh, I've linked them here, but they were taken down many years ago and they're unavailable except for the Internet Archive Wayback Machine. And so I definitely think it's important to have a record of these things here in this particular in this uh, podcast today. So that's another reason why I think it's important to have uh, these read out. But immediately underneath the Von Hildebrand reply, Miesel responded. And this is what she said, quote, Dr. Von Hildebrand raises three issues. Is the book the actual memoir of a communist agent sent into the Catholic priesthood? Did such infiltration happen in America, as convert Bella Dodd claimed? Is infiltration responsible for the church's disarray since Vatican II? In 1994, I wrote an article denouncing AA 1025. Having just reread it to write this rebuttal, I again draw on my training in history and experience writing and editing fiction to brand the book a fabrication, a piece of propaganda. No one ever wrote a memoir the way this book is written. Important events could not have occurred as described. The protagonist couldn't have crossed the sealed Polish-Russian border in 1931. He couldn't have been reporting to the same intelligence handler throughout the Russian purges, which are never mentioned, and World War II during the thousand-day siege of Leningrad. His account of meeting the spy chief contains not a word of hard description, somehow failing to notice that the unnamed Ye uh, Yezov was a dwarf. Moreover, the protagonist never uses a word of Marxist jargon. It hardly took much prophetic skill to predict the vernacular mass in 1972 when the book was written. As for hitting the bullseye from the first page to the last, do we have ordained fathers and mothers celebrating mass on the family table before dinner every night? No, but we do have priests celebrating mass on a raft. I, I just, I, so I had to throw that out there. <laughs> Are the naves of our churches filled with commun communion tables for groups of 12? Have we abolished infant baptism, marriage ceremonies, private confession, vestments, altar cloths, candles, the sign of the cross, a Sunday mass obligation, the term Catholic? Are believers in union with the Pope ever likely to do so? As I said, AA 1025 is a fable seething with hatred of ecumenism. I don't understand why someone of Dr. Von Hildebrand's stature would give it a second glance. As for Bella Dodd's story of sending um, more than a thousand men into American seminaries, that would have required chatting up approximately one youth per week and corrupting them so permanently that they stuck with the party after ordination. It's convenient that she was forbidden to name names, not even private communications to Rome. Were those four cardinals collaborating in religion or politics? Clerics make useful idiots. The Soviets, like the present Red Chinese, had no interest in altering Christian beliefs. Theology was irrelevant. A compliant church loyal to the regime and its peace initiatives was quite enough. AA 1025 notwithstanding, the uh, Verona documents intercepted Soviet intelligence, speak of military spying and influence on many sectors of American society, but not the Catholic Church or any other religion. I think we could probably maybe update that knowledge a little bit. I remember, this is almost 20 years ago. I'd be interested to know if there's an update on that. Then she says, I got my Catholic education before Vatican II and am bitter about what happened afterwards. Infiltrators, real or otherwise, are unnecessary to explain our problems of the past 40 years much less the priest scandals. History is a messy record of myriad choices, not the plan of secret masters. I'm not sure what that F stands for, but that, that was in the original text. So pretty blistering response, uh, very direct. And as a native Bostonian, I very much appreciate that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, you know, so you have to wonder about some of these things. Um, you know, and Measle gives a very good response, I think, to Dr. Von Hildebrand, you know, basically trying to call her back and say, uh, you're off the reservation, Dr. Von Hildebrand. 
And for anybody to be able to say that to Alice von Hildebrand, that's almost unthinkable. But here it is. And Measle, I think, handled herself pretty well. So then, by way of uh, kind of just wrapping things up or a summary, since this famous quarrel between Measle and von Hildebrand, AA 1025 has remained in the background of traditionalist thinking. No real scholarly work, however, has been done, and Marie Curie herself remains largely unknown in the English-speaking world. The book continues, though, to be available for sale and resale via various outlets. It continues to influence people, and I think the best interpretation that one can give of the book at this time is that it contains a fictitious story about very real matters of concern to many people within the Catholic Church. And then one final note, uh, uh, as I'm not going to read it, it's there, I've talked about it elsewhere, but uh, as someone who has written about Belladon, I would be remiss if I didn't at least show people what Alice von Hildebrand said in, in response to Measle about Belladon. I have a, 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 an essay about Belladon that's been published on Homiletic and Pastoral Review. I encourage people to uh, take a look at that. I'm also very happy to reiterate, because I think I said it before in RNT, that there is a book coming out on Bella Dodd by doctors Paul Kengor and Mary Lewis, uh, excuse me, uh, Mary Nicholas. And I think it's going to be a very good book for people to have, very eye opening, uh, in depth research, lots of footnotes. I think there's over 900 of them. Um, so there's going to be some good solid work there done on that. So the, the, the in other words, the conversations continue. We're learning more. People are going deeper. And I think it's very good for us to, um, to have these conversations so that we, we know more of what's going on. I think that's the last one. Yeah, that's the last of the uh, PowerPoints. Thank so, you for the presentation. Everybody send your chat questions in the comment section to at Reason in Theology. We will uh, do our best to get to them. Given them a second to put them in there. But it sounds to me, by the way, somebody asked, did Marie, the author, convert to Islam? Is that true or false? Uh, she had a book about Islam. Uh, Somebody said that she converted, and I don't know if that has been confirmed anywhere. I could not find evidence for that claim. No, she wrote a book, Islam and Us, mm -hmm. I believe. <clears throat> uh, let me flip back through my PowerPoint. Uh, mm -hmm. to that list. I I find it very hard to believe because she wrote uh, Islam and uh, us and Islam, or Islam and Us, in 1975. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she wrote that book, The Pastor of Pastors, in 1980. Mm -hmm. And if she converted to Islam, why are traditionalist Catholics still promoting her works? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wouldn't be surprised about that, but I don't, I haven't seen any facts that she converted to Islam, but I wouldn't consider the fact that some people still promote her works because they're traditional that that somehow proves anything because I've seen some traditionalists promote all kinds of things that are illogical. Um, but yeah, I haven't seen any facts of that. So if y'all can maybe confirm that otherwise to me, it sounds just like speculation, but I figured I would ask because I know, I know you've researched this. So somebody else was asking, could you do a video on contemporary French culture and Catholicism? Unsure if you just read the language or, or are also familiar with the culture? I think Dom would probably be the better person to do that uh, yeah. from the Logo Project. Mm -hmm. I am not that well versed on it. I mean, I, I studied French in high school and my I've maintained general French uh, language knowledge over the years as I've worked mm -hmm. on theology, mm -hmm. uh, worked in theology, but as far as in-depth culture stuff, um, I, I don't think I would be the person for that. No. Mm -hmm. Here's a interesting one in light of some upcoming events. Can you do a response to the ancient aliens episodes on Fatima secrets being about aliens existing for fun? Care to comment on that? Uh, Aliens exist for fun, or you're saying that I should do this for the video for fun. 
okay because the grammar there is a little compounded yeah um no i am not going to do that but i will be on the unexplained with william shatner i leave okay. pretty soon to actually for that interview I think i'm that's excited first time about announcing that. it publicly yeah i'm excited yeah. about that <laughs> yeah me and actually one of my priest friends are going to be on it too so so y'all are going to talk about uh fatima with william shatner <laughs> Apparently, yeah. Well, the we, we we won't be in the same room. This is all right, TV magic, right, you know, right, but, right, yeah. Uh, he just narrates the script at the end of every everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it'd be nice it, if I read it to him. <laughs> I don't know if he'll be there. I think he, what he does is he just comes in and reads the script and narrates the thing, and you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. I I found it to be interesting. Um. Classic mad trad narrative, no need for reason or theological arguments. We found a convenient briefcase. Even Yves Dupont, a mad trad lying propagandist himself, condemned AA 1025. What are your thoughts here? Do you agree with that? Yves Dupont? Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm, I've read, read his, Yves, not Yves Chiron, but there was an Yves no, something. He, he has a book on, published by Tan on Catholic prophecies. Okay, it's yeah, all like secondary is. sources that can't be confirmed. <laughs> it's just, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, I don't know if, like, uh, can we condemn the book or uh, when you look at it from the context of, and I know Yves Dupont would have been in, from this culture, but it's a literary artifice that she was using in order to explain a certain angst that people had. You know, mm -hmm. I don't know what DuPont's grounds were for condemning the book. Was he condemning it on historical grounds, saying that this absolutely never happened? Or I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'd have to look at look at what he said in response to it. But I think it's hard to condemn it, strictly speaking, in the terms of the historical or the ver veracity of it, because she never claimed it was, in fact, historical. You know, that she was the nurse that found these documents. It was always a literary artifice. But we get confused in the English world because we don't have that background on her. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm a little, I'd have to see what, what DuPont says mm -hmm. for me to be able to respond accordingly. But I, was, I, don't, I wasn't even aware that he had responded to it. So that's mm -hmm. news to me. Here's a fun one. What do you think of the recent non-image recognition-based evidence for the two Lucys being different persons, plastic surgeons saying the chin is skeletal and so can't be denture? Not a supporter of the fake Lucy theory, just asking since it's a curiosity. Any comments here? I, I thought we were discussing AA-1025, <laughs> yeah, economy issues. Right. It's completely unrelated, but just curious if you had any thoughts about it. I don't. I, I don't give Hoynowski the right time of day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be perfectly blunt because it's so absurd and outlandish what this that I don't see any need to comment other yeah. than what I've just said. And he knows this, uh, and he knows why I think this because of our personal correspondence that we've had. Um, but I can't say what I want to say because I would be thrown into a court of law for uh, for defamation. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, all the other questions are unrelated so we'll leave it there go ahead and uh put in a plug for your website and your content where, where can we go to learn more uh please visit my website kevinsimmons.com um and i have various interests like mostly with the fatima discussions and church's theology of private revelation but um the information on marie Curie was of interest to me several years ago when i was researching some things i was like oh okay yeah so uh, that's why that this is kind of connected, but uh, uh, a little bit with the understanding more of that traditionalist world and the Fatima writings in general, and uh, also the St. Michael prayer uh, that Pope Leo XIII had composed. Um, I think it was against that background that I did this kind of research back in 2015. Uh, but yeah, just most primarily my website, KevinSimmons.com, uh, my books as well, Pope Leo XIII, The Prayer to St. Michael, Refractions of Light, and on the third part of The Secret of Fatima. Anybody's interested, please, you know, they're available on Amazon and the publisher's websites as well. Thanks for doing this. This was really helpful. I haven't seen anybody really engage it. So this was certainly enlightening. I appreciate you doing it. Everybody hit that like button and hit the subscribe button. Uh, share this on your social media so we can get the facts straight on this issue. Because like I said, I'm seeing people promote it. So it's good to know the entire perspective here. Once again, hit that like button and subscribe button. Also, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me.
See you later. God bless. Oh, wait, before you go, I would really appreciate it if you would consider supporting this channel. This is my primary means to provide for my family, and it also helps me to produce content like this video. If you would like to support me, become a patron by visiting patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. You'll also get access to extra exclusive content when you become a patron. Lastly, hit that like button and the subscribe button, and be sure to leave a comment down below. God bless.